or sorry, this part. Miami University Blockchain Club and everyone else involved to uh, learn how we can do some basic decentralized app development. Uh, and we right now are going to be implementing the Taurus Direct Auth software development kit, which is gonna allow us to use a Web2 like um, user experience to inject Web3 private public keys. So first off, there's a demo that we'll uh, show in a moment once we go through the credits. Um, and you can actually access that yourself at taurus.mebc.io uh, and make sure you're connecting with the HTTPS uh, encryption as that is required. Um, but we'll also talk about what are the motivations to actually use something uh, that uh, takes away the Web3 experience to a degree, why we would wanna go back to uh, Web2, uh, as well as we'll talk about how Taurus actually accomplishes this and what the consequences are for us as software developers and uh, for the users downstream. Uh, after that, we will go through and walk through every single step uh, you need to get this app up and running in your own local machine or even on a server. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're gonna kind of get you run through how you should be using this as a boilerplate for your other applications. And we'll also talk a little bit about how this fits into the whole series of basic DAP development. Hey guys, this is Ian Bryan and uh, I helped develop this application and I wanted to give a special thanks to the Taurus Foundation who uh, without them, this wouldn't be possible. Um, right now we're transitioning from web two to web three and it can be a little bit jarring going from usernames and passwords to hexadecimal addresses and private keys. Um, not everyone can make that uh, change very quickly, but Taurus provides a way to uh, give a little bit of familiarity to a uh, bit of a new concept. So um, go check them out at tour.us. And um, yeah, that, again, thank you to them for making this possible. And thank you to the Midwest Blockchain Consortium. Um, well, I'm basically thanking myself, uh, but yeah, um, we as an organization, um, Miami University Blockchain Club is one of the founding members. Uh, we are a federation of a bunch of different Midwest blockchain clubs, uh, just trying to provide educational resources and generate professional opportunities, uh, given you'll see a lot of the times uh, the universities and administrations around us uh, aren't very conducive of um, a, an environment where blockchain education can thrive. So um, we're definitely kind of going at it alone, but pulling all our resources together and it's allowed us to do some really wonderful things. So uh, stick with us to see uh, what we can do. And if you are a developer and are trying to go through this or need some assistance, definitely uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us on our Discord, which we'll leave a uh, link to below. Hey guys, it's Ian again, and uh, this is my voice. That's me on the screen as well. Um, if you like what you see here today, you can check me out at uh, my LinkedIn down there and um, my GitHub, which is uh, IAN BRIGHT. Right now, I'm going to walk you through what a traditional Web3 experience would be like uh, with a sp supply chain application. So starting off, we're going to refresh this page and we're going to want to, in order to use this application, we're going to want to log into MetaMask. So right here, select an account, click connect, we're connected, and now refresh the page and see, and then now we're connected to an application. Um, so starting off, if you want to do something like add an item, we'll just say fake item price one, two, three, add item. We've got to verify transaction with MetaMask, which, you know, this is kind of ugly. You've got a big uh, pop up over the screen. You have to confirm a transaction and uh, then wait for it to go through. This might just take a sec. Um, 
Yeah, so this, this will just take a minute. Okay, you know what, this might um might not be working right now. So you get the idea, um, with a basic Web3 experience, you're going to have to log in through a log. Oh, there it goes, it works. See, that now we have uh, transaction 437, whatever that means up there. Uh, it's anyone's best guess, but now we can view the item here. And uh, that's, uh, that's one step in the process. But you can see with the traditional Web3 experience, you have to First, log in with the with your wallet, um, verify you're connected to the application, and then each time you uh, perform a transaction, you're gonna have to verify that you want to confirm and go through the transaction via MetaMask. So, uh, you know, in a traditional experience, this isn't very ideal. Um, you're not gonna want to see an ugly pop up each time and have to confirm every single thing. So. All right, so now that we've seen what a traditional Web3 experience looks like, we'll see what Taurus Direct Up can provide towards a more Web2-like experience uh, for a Web3 application. So this is our Taurus integrated application right here. You can see at the top we have our providers. Um, and right now we're going to go ahead and log in. We log in. You know, this is a, a typical OAuth uh, login for Google. So you prompt in your email addresses, click your email address, and then this logs you into the application. So see your username here, profile photo, and here is your public Ethereum address that Taurus has provided to, for you. Um, and this is the initial value we have on the contract. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate real quick what it actually looks like, uh, what is actually happening once um, we change the value on here, because unlike the last application we showed you, MetaMask isn't going to prompt you for um, prompt you to confirm whether or not you want to go through the transaction. I'll just do so automatically. So we'll go here. One, two, three, four. Set value. Just take a sec here. All right, so the transaction's gone through. You can see we haven't been prompted with the MetaMask uh, modal. So to show you what happened and confirm this was actually uh, transacted on the blockchain, we'll copy this address, search it on Etherscan. You can see right here, 17 seconds ago, see more and down here we'll get the value that was inputted convert this hexadecimal to regular uh base 10 numbers you can see one two three four matches the value here so that is uh it's pretty cool that you're able to do that without having to see the modal each time pop up it gives much more of a uh, fluid web 2 experience and uh another feature we have here uh persistent logins so Taurus provides a way to uh, get your user login information by logging in each time, but th there's no persistent state. So we did this by using local storage. So when we refresh the page, um, you can see we're still logged in because we're able to get that information back from local storage. Uh, you log out and see you're actually logged out now. And uh, you can go ahead, log back into Taurus once you've logged out. All right, now we are going to set up our Google Verifier for this application on Taurus. And this is a required step. You can use other gateways besides from Google, but um, you're gonna need to get some sort of authentication token for your client and send that off to the Taurus team. So step one is going to be making sure that you have uh, both a user account uh, on the Google Cloud platform, as well as you've made some app for this application. Um, and we can actually go look at that. Um, so uh, once you've created an app, you might not see all of this, but essentially you just go up to the top and pop this down, new project and, and walk through that. Um, and then it should pop you out back into a dashboard that looks uh, close to this, and you're going to want to go to the APIs. And from here, 
the first thing you're going to want to do is go to this OAuth consent screen. And again, you're going to want to fill all of this out before you proceed. You can't uh, get a client ID without doing all of this. So make sure you do that. Um, once you've done that, you can then go to your credentials and specifically you want an OAuth 2.0 client ID. So you can go to create credential, OAuth client ID. Web applications. And again, I'm not gonna um, step through all of, oh, actually this one is uh, pretty important. So um, right here, for your application, you do actually need to specify the URI that you're going to access at. So we're all going to be using the development server. So do HTTP, that's even right here. <laughs> um, Localhost 8000, which is where Gatsby's development server uh, pops up and service worker redirect. And if you're going to try to put this on a server um, like we are, uh, you're also going to want to make sure that you do HTTPS um, torus.mubc.io um, slash service worker slash redirect. And once we later go to configure uh, this DNS, um, we can also access it here. So with these two things configured, we then can use this OAuth client ID at these two URIs. Um, and you would click create here. Now, when you've done that, it's gonna show you a client ID and the one we want is right here. So we can just click this button to copy the client ID. Um, actually, let's grab a different one for the sake of anonymity one we're not using. Um, and the next step, once you have this client ID or if you're using Twitter, if you're using something else, whatever bear token you need, um, and you're gonna wanna email the Taurus people at hello at Taurus.us. Uh, and you just wanna let them know that you have an identifier set up for a specific social gateway and that you want to get it verified on their network. So just paste that in, hit send. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna go ahead and say, yes, we verified this client ID. Here is the name of the actual verifier on our network. And that name is going to be very simple, um, but they'll send you two values back into the email, which you're gonna then turn around and take and put in your Gatsby Taurus Direct E3 environment. Um, and you can put that right here, or you're gonna put your uh, client ID right here. Um, so that value we were just working with. And then in our case, they sent us back mubc-google as our verifier name. So that's literally just what we put here. Um, and this is titled.example.env. You're going to need to, if you're using HTTP, uh, put this file in. And if you're using HTTPS, you're gonna need this one. Okay, so now we are going to go through the last required step to getting your Taurus application set up. There is a third step after this if you want to host it um, on a server, and we'll walk through how to do that on AWS in a moment. But if you're perfectly content getting this all done on your local host, this is the last step. And uh, as a bit of a warning, um, between uh, starting filming this and now, the faucet here actually went down. So we made some changes to the code that might be uh, discernible as you get farther in the video, but really shouldn't make too much of a difference uh, when you get there. Um, so what we've actually added is a way in the environment variable to um, set the network you want to connect to. So we will be using Covan today instead, uh, but let's actually go through all the steps. So the very first thing you need to do is get the actual code repository and put it on your computer. So let's do that with HTTPS. And then if you're on Linux, which most of you probably aren't, uh, or if you're even on Mac, which many of you are, 
Um, opening up the terminal will be completely fine to copy every single command that I do, um, at least assuming that you have Node installed and stuff like that. But there are um, tutorials on that. That's some super basic stuff. Um, but if you are on Windows, you may need to download something like Git Bash to enter the same commands I'm doing. Otherwise, you're going to need to know that uh, all of the commands with PowerShell are completely different. So um, just beware, either know enough to do it or download Git Bash so that you can follow along uh, correctly. So Git clone will download the Gatsby Taurus Direct to uh, our computer. Let's go into it. And the first step is going to be to install the code that is in package.json. So if you don't know what's going on, all these dependencies right here, we're specifying them in the repository uh, so that we don't have to store all this code right here. Um, and then we're running um, this npm i command to actually load that all in. And we'll fast forward through this. All right. So that took forever. Um, maybe not in the video, but it will for you. It did for me. Um, so the next thing, we'll also just go ahead and install the blockchain folder. This one will run much quicker, though. All right. So now we're going to do an optional step for those of you who have mnemonics that are filled with ether or you just generally know what you're doing you have a metamask any reason that you already have a mnemonic and want to supply it you don't need to do this uh, we're just trying to produce a new wallet so that we can use it in our environment so the very first step that we're going to take is um, npx ganache CLI. And what this is doing is NPX uh, will let you run um, NPM scripts um, on a server. So you don't actually have to download the Ganache CLI um, source to run it. So now it has spat out a random account that it's filled a um, also development blockchain uh, with Ether for. So this account actually works on any Ethereum chain or any derivative of Ethereum. So we want two things. Um, first, we want to grab this. This is going to be the mnemonic that we use from now on. If um, you wanted to go mess around in MetaMask, which actually you probably will to um, fund the account at least once, which will show off, um, you're going to have to deal with that. So we need that. And we also need to grab this as we're going to um, fund this account with Covan Ether. So let's do that step right now. And you can go to the Covan Gitter. What you need to have is a GitHub account um, in order for them to trust your identity enough to provide you Ether. So currently, this faucet is dispensing for Ether. I don't know what the cooldown is, but for Ether is enough for plenty of uh, failed contracts. So all we have to do is send it. And I guess looks like it takes a minute. So we'll, again, speed this part up. Or actually, you know what? We will just go do other things while we wait for it. Um, and we'll come back to it. So another thing you're going to need to do is create an Infura account and endpoint. So if you haven't done that already, go through the authentication process and then dashboard, Ethereum, um, create new project. And let's just do Taurus. Create. And we now have our project with an ID, we can potentially add a secret if we wanted to. And you wouldn't want to be showing this off. So of course, I just created this for this video. It doesn't matter. But um, in practice, especially if you're not securing the project ID with a project secret, um, you don't want to show this off. Um, but we're not really going to do anything to it. 
um, all we need to grab uh, is this ID right here. You might see that this is set for the mainnet. This doesn't actually prevent you from connecting to other endpoints. You'll see if you, let's, let's choose Covan. All that happens is this string right here changes. So all we're interested in is this project ID because we do all of this logic already in the code. So let's see, is he responded? Awesome, yeah, so, okay. Uh, for ether sent. Cool. Um, so let's actually go through and the last step, I gotta log out of this account lock. Um, let's go take a look with this mnemonic. Oh, whoops. That was stupid. Um, again, don't show off your password. Pop it open for Ether. Awesome. Okay. So we will come back to this in a moment, but it's cool to see that that actually worked. Um, so we don't need this now. Um, we do still need this. So now the next step is going to be to pop this back open. Uh, we no longer need this test blockchain. Um, if you want to set it up, you can obviously, you can go, you don't need to use Infura and you can um, generate, you can do Ganache CLI dash M and put your mnemonic right there and connect straight to localhost 8545 or something like that. Um, I think you can also use, if you look at cat truffle config, there is the development network if you want to migrate there. So all that's set up. But again, we are not doing that. We're connecting now to a real blockchain. Um, and we're going to deploy our contract there. So um, if we look at uh, example EMB, we need Infura and Mnemonic. So um, you can actually cp um, dot example EMB to dot EMB and then nano dot EMB. Get rid of this. Infura paste. Or, whoops. Um, not elite enough to know how to undo that in one command, but we'll put that there. Grab this, put this here, right out. Cool. So now that we have done all of that, we are finally ready to deploy to Covan. So um, and again, if you're doing RinkB, if you find a way to get RinkB Ether uh, or Ropsten uh, or any of these other chains, you just change the command a little bit, but truffle uh, migrate. And if you don't have truffle, you can do npx truffle, um, but it runs a little quicker because I do have it. So I'm going to do truffle migrate network coban. And this takes a while. It's going to run through the dry run of the migration. Just Basically, it will internally make sure that everything adds up and it won't fail when sent to the uh, live network. Um, and then it's actually going to um, send it to the live network. So again, we'll skip through all of this or at least. Okay, so now we have done pretty much everything we need to do um, with the blockchain. So if we actually were to go um, ls build contracts, we can see that there are two JSON files here. These are called ABIs um, and uh, application binary interfaces, and they specify all of the available methods that can be used to interact with an on-chain asset. So you don't need a full um, Solidity file or a full contract to interact with it once it's been deployed. You only need this artifact of the contract file to do everything you need to do. Um, and sometimes these ABIs will contain the um, network they're deployed on. When we run our Truffle script, it actually does do that. So um, when we go look at um, cats, components, hooks, um, right here, so Covan is network 42. Uh, it's going to run this and chain ID would return 42 um, in the next part. We'll kind of talk about how that's specified really quickly. Um, 
and then it'll pass it in, get that simple storage, which again comes from that build file we just created with the migration. And because we migrated it to Covan, this field is available and we can use it to connect to that contract. And it's available for uh, Taurus to then sign uh, transactions with. So let's actually get, oops, um, let's, let's actually get the app itself up and running locally as well. So there's one other step. We can look at the example ENV here. Um, looks like it's actually missing. Um, yeah, okay. Um, looks like it is missing for some reason, uh, one of the ENV things. So you're also going to need Gatsby network. Uh, that will definitely be changed in the GitHub. Um, but on this video, uh, it's showing up like that. So uh, we'll just do again, cp.example.env. And so the way Gatsby works is you can actually specify environment variables without having to use .env or anything like that. Um, and you can specify different ones for your production build versus your development build. But in order to do that, you can't just have a .env file. Um, you have to do .env .development. And when we get into the next part of the environment setup, which is again optional, but where we're doing the server, um, we would do .env .production. But um, nano .env .development. And so our base URL in this case is going to be localhost. Um, 8,000. Actually, and we want to specify HTTP um, localhost 8,000 because that's where Gatsby will build it at. And then Gatsby network equals, if we wanted to do Rinkby, we'd do Rinkby, Ropston, um, development. Uh, development might not actually resolve um, given that that's not going to come back to a chain ID, but um, if you do Covan, it will. So we're going to do Covan. And then again, um, verifier name and client ID um, are the two that we went over in the previous step, um, actually getting those in there. Um, so I'm not going to go over that because there was obviously a little bit of overlap. And I don't want to expose this for the actual functioning build. So um, I'm going to. Okay, so now the final step is to literally just deploy it. So we can do that with npm run start. Now that it's built, please go away zoom. We can go to localhost 8000 where it will show up. And we've got our app. So let's go ahead and log in. And if it doesn't pop up right here, um, chances are you have done something wrong with the configuration of your environment variable. So if you're stuck here, um, that's where you should be looking. But let's go ahead. And if you get stuck here and it says uh, the, the redirect right after takes you to uh, Gatsby 404 page, um, you've done something wrong with authenticating the service workers or you're not correctly on HTTP, like you're trying to run um, a development server um, from an actual server and connection, connecting to it over the internet. Um, so this setup will only work on a local host connection. But now we're almost done. We opened up MetaMask earlier, and again, we're going to be showing off how we integrate gas station network into this specific application in a future video. Um, however, to keep it concise, given how um, much content there is already, um, those are two separate things. So currently in order to fund this address and get it to um, be able to make a transaction, mutate this value, we need to open our MetaMask that we've authenticated with Covan. And uh, we're going to send to that trend or to that address 
Uh, you can do 0 0.1, you, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's do 0 0.1. Next, confirm. All right, finally. And now we can set it to whatever value we want. There it is. And we can validate that this is actually doing something on chain with um, coven.etherscan.io. It's a little hacky, but right here, this is it interacting with the contract. So that's the contract address. If we look at this transaction hash. Um, Input. And that's hex, that's A, so that's 10. Um, it goes, even if you don't know hex, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's just in single base. So that's 10. Um, and we can be confident that our change has reflected. You know, we can prove publicly that there was a change to the network. So there you have it. We have the entire app up and running on the development server. All right, so now on to the optional server demo, which is going to cost you some money here and there. Um, one thing you're going to have to do is get a .xyz domain um, at the very least. So it's a dollar for the first year. You're probably going to throw this away, but if you don't, it'll uh, apparently go up to eight and two. So relatively cheap. And the second thing you're gonna need is an AWS account. Um, you may be able to get away with running a free T2 micro, which we'll get into what that means in a minute, but our app is uh, a little heavy and uh, we kind of need a T2 small to get it running or at least get it built. So uh, for our demo, you're most likely gonna have to run a T2 small instance, at least for uh, a little bit. So um, let's, actually go into the process of that. So the first thing you're going to want to do is, again, if you don't have AWS, get an AWS, then go into EC2. Um, and once we are in uh, Elastic Compute Containers, we can go to Launch Instance. Error loading AMI data. Great. Let's just refresh. So um, you're generally going to want to choose Ubuntu um, 20.04. LTS is the current um, version that's got long time support, as they call it, um, just the standardized version. So this is going to be the easiest one. And again, it's also free tier eligible among a few others. But I would recommend going with this one. Um, and then. Again, this T2 micro, this um, one memory uh, or one gigabyte of memory is insufficient while building the Gatsby file, which is a little bit kind of our fault. But um, <laughs> if you want to get it running, this is what you have to do. So we do also uh, have to choose a, at least a T2 small with uh, two gigabytes of memory. Um, and you don't need to configure anything else. You can review and launch. Um, and we'll get to the security group in a moment because we do need to add um, 443 rules. So this is one other thing. We can actually um, walk through the process of creating a new pay key pair real quick. Um, so uh, Taurus download key pair. That's just gonna show up in my downloads, I, I guess. Um, cool. And now choose existing. There it is. I acknowledge launch instances. And you're going to need this key, at least the very first time you connect. We'll go through how to get your account set up really quickly. Again, this will go through uh, pretty much everything just to get you set up. So now if we scroll down, we can see view instances. 
And while this spins up, does it have an IP? Yes, it does. So this is the point where uh, you need your DNS. So I'm going to use Route 53, but the process is pretty much exactly the same in Namecheap for setting an A record. So essentially what we need to do is grab this and go back into the AWS dashboard. It's right here, but if you search it up, Route 53. And again, your process will be a little bit different uh, if you're using Namecheap or if you're using any other um, hosted DNS service. But um, all you need to do is add an A record wherever you are hosting it. So we'll go in. Create record. Taurus 2. It's not the most creative, but we've already got Taurus up. So it's already an A record. All right, perfect. And Taurus 2 now exists. So that should resolve relatively quickly. AWS is super quick. If you're using Namecheap or something, it might take like five minutes. Um, and for both of these, it might take more. Um, but pretty soon we should be able to resolve this EC2 instance by that IP to taurus2.mebc.io. Um, and I'm not gonna mess around with naming it right now because I'm probably gonna get rid of it right after, but uh, as you get more servers, you can name them. Um, looks like it's still spinning up. So um, we can still, oh, Right. Well, we can still get the command set up while we wait. Um, so what you want to do is you want to pop your terminal back open. And wherever you downloaded that key file to, so in my case, um, it was the downloads folder. It'll probably be the same for you. You want to navigate there. So, And you're going to have that dot pem file there so what we want is again we have this address ssh dash i and that will allow us to specify a specific key file rather than having to have it associated with our user so um that shows up torus.pem and then since we use the ubuntu ami um it preloads with Ubuntu as the root user at this. So now let's see if it has refreshed. Awesome. So our server is up. Really, we should probably be able to, um, let's check ping torus 2mebcio Cool. So we should be able to do ssh i torus.pem ubuntu at torus2.mubc.io. Oh, uh, oh, I would have said 700. There we go. And now we're in. All right, so the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is um, update and upgrade uh, all of our um, core dependencies. So, well, not for the um, application, for the actual um, instance. So sudo apt get update and sudo apt get upgrade. And while we wait for that to start, um, we can also go ahead and just make sure that in our security, um, which we'll go click on the security group. Now we actually have a pre-configured security group for other servers, um, but just if you have none, you go to edit the inbound rules. Um, and we don't care about whether or not we can run it um, on the development host, so we don't need port 8000. 
All we need is the HTTPS port, which is 443. Um, and we want anyone to be able to connect to it. Um, oh, you know what? We can actually specify that like this. Um, save rules. And just edit this one more time and add HTTPS or HTTP vanilla. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is get node installed through the node version manager command line. And you can use this, um, the just NVM git repository has um, an install script, which you can grab and use with curl. Um, let me even give it to you right here, but let's run that. And we need to run source bash RC. Now we should have node or at least NVM. So now what we can do is NVM use, let's say uh, 12 or sorry, we have to do NVM I 12 first. That will install node version 12. We can do NVM use 12. And that's it. Now we have node. Um, and now there's one more step, at least from the installation standpoint. We need to get Apache 2. So sudo apt get update or sudo apt get install Apache 2 if it's not already on. Yeah, it's not. All right, so now we're going to install an SSL certificate, which is required for HTTPS. So we've gone to CertBot, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation's free uh, service for getting these certificates. So we're going to go ahead and use the SNAP package manager for Ubuntu. And it wants us to run sudo snap install classic search bot. And it wants us to make a system link as well so that we can access it from wherever we want the script from the command line. So now we should be able to run the final command to get this certification set up. Um, and let's go ahead and do that. Sudo cert bot. Uh, we don't need cert only. Uh, let's just Apache. Um, or I guess I already went through. It's gonna ask you for a couple of other things. So. Um, there will be uh, a prompt for your email and a couple of EFF things. Um, now it's asking you for your actual domain. So we're going to do tours2.mabc.io, which is um, the current instance we're connected to and what the top level domain points to at tours2.mabc.io. So if we run that, it's going to check to verify that that domain is actually owned uh, and can be signed for uh, this SSL script. Looks like it works. And we can actually test um, whether or not our server is compliant by typing in now tours2.mubc.io or whatever your host name is. And it's going through and performing a bunch of different validations to make sure that it can resolve everything correctly uh, and provide this little check mark right here. And I'm not going to wait for it to resolve everything, but in general, it's coming back. So now we're pretty much set up and we can actually deploy our application. If we navigate to taurus2.mubc.io, it comes up as um, trusted and we have the default Apache 2 page, which is perfect. So now we want to actually go ahead, grab the code, and we're going to go through a very similar process as with the development steps, but it's going to be a little different so let's step through that. Step one, of course, get clone. And we're going to go into that and run the npm i, again, installing all of the different dependencies. All right, and I skipped in the video, but if it throws some errors in there uh, before saying added 
X packages, don't worry too much about that. It should still work. So we're going to go into the blockchain folder and do the same thing. And now same process, we want to create that environment folder or environment file with um, the same mnemonic and Infura secret key that you had before. So I just have those on hand. You can paste that in. And now we should be able to run truffle migrate network coban again. Of course, npx truffle migrate network coban. All right, so now the final step is going to be doing that um, environment file for the parent directory for the application. So we can cp example.env to .env.production and nano.env.production. Again, add Gatsby network if that wasn't already there um you don't need this comment either um but again we're building this on the server now so make sure that you label this dot env dot production not dot env um, dot development so here you again we're going to use covan but you want to specify https um semicolon slash slash torus to dot mubc dot io or whatever your server is um, but these two are going to be the same as before, same as Coban. So, so now that we have that environment file, we are completely done setting it up and we can npx Gatsby build. And this will create the production bundle that we will serve out of Apache. All right, now that that's done building, we should be able to run a single command to get rid of the current Apache build and replace it with what we have created. And we can do that with, or not clear, sudo rm-rf var whtml. And this will delete everything that exists in the Apache build. sudo cp-r. Um, public, and this is the build folder that we just used or created. And we want to dump it in that or whoops, in that Apache directory. Now, if we run that, we go to torus2.mubc.io. There we go. Assuming we've got our identifier all set up correctly, um, we should be able to log in, which we were. And we already sent Covan Ether um, when we did this development uh, or when we did the localhost build. So we don't need to do that again. Now, if we actually try to interact with the contract, even though it's a different contract and the value has been reset to zero, um, set value while we wait for that just open up coban.etherscan.io and yeah there it goes and we can verify excuse me there we go We should expect to see C, C, yeah. And, and that is the end of the environment setup. So we'll go over now a little bit more of how the actual code works uh, with respect to the hook and how everything is rendered. All right, so I'm gonna quickly demonstrate the life cycle of this application from login to log out. So starting off, we click the login button Wait for your list of emails to pop up. Uh, go ahead and click the one you want to log in with that's connected to Taurus and uh, wait for it to load. You'll see here uh, we're logged in right now. And uh, if we refresh the page, 
we're still logged in. Uh, we can go ahead and close this tab, go back there, verify we're still logged in. And uh, finally, uh, we already demonstrated the functionality of the smart contract, but um, now that uh, we've gone through the life cycle or gone through the stages of logging in, all there is left to do is log out. So uh, go ahead, log out, verify we're logged out and the session is ended. And uh, that is the entire life cycle of this application. So now we're gonna jump into the code and show uh, what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, so starting off, when we hit the login button, we uh, trigger a function fittingly called log login. And what we're doing here is we're awaiting a Taurus object to initiate and uh, or in initialize. And up here, basically, uh, we call the Taurus object, uh, pass in the URL that we're using for application, uh, wh whatever um, results back to the server you're using. Uh, in the init Taurus function, we initialize that Taurus object we have. And back down here, uh, once we finally have a valid Taurus object, we can call a function called trigger login. And what that basically does is uh, with the environment variables we went over in the setup earlier, we pass those in and we're able to retrieve user info for uh, the email address that was provided or uh, whatever OAuth provider you're using, um, the account that goes back to an individual user. Um, but once we have that user info, uh, we destructure that, set it inside of a user state variable. From there, we initialize an ethers wallet and we'll actually go into detail uh, more on that in a sec. And then finally, uh, we create the logged in session. And um, real fast, we're gonna show you what uh, actually goes into that because Taurus as it stands does not provide uh, persistent logged in sessions. So we're actually, the way to get around that is we use local storage. So uh, when we create a session, we get the info for the specific user that's logged in, store that information in local storage. And once that is stored in there, um, to make sure that we don't log out every time the page is refreshed or we close the browser or tab, uh, we just wanna check, okay, is a public address stored in local storage? If it is, then we know we can restore the section because uh, all that information for that particular user is there. So we, we can get everything back that we had before. And uh, jumping into that function, uh, we're basically just getting all the information from local storage, setting that into the user state variable, um, creating a new ethers wallet um, instance, and then finally sending that to the ethers state variable. And again, we'll go over that in a sec. But uh, after that, all there is to do is log out and uh, all that logout really does is completely clear local storage. So when we refresh the page, uh, it's impossible to set the user state variable again because all that info is gone. And uh, finally, to force uh, the application to log out, we just set the user to null. And uh, that brings us back to this screen right here where we can log in again. All right, so now that we've gone through the entire life cycle, uh, I think it would be a good time to explain how exactly this logged in state is distributed through the app. So we use something in React called context. And um, you know it, you can follow this link right here because there's much too much uh, detail that goes into it to actually go, go over all of it in this uh, demonstration. But uh, if you're interested, just check out the React docs and they'll give a good explanation on it. Um, but yeah, it, what we're doing in this case is we are creating something called a user context, which is basically passing all of this information throughout all the applications. So normally in React, where you would pass things from uh, parent props to child props, uh, context actually allows you to pass state uh, regardless of where you're located in the application because um, the context provider wraps the entire application and thus is accessible throughout any uh, subcomponent. Um, but basically, uh, we're setting all the relevant state variables in this entire file, auth.js, and um, you know, user, ethers are all relevant. And then we can also pass in uh, functions to the context as well. So log in, log out, and this is all very useful because they're these are relevant um, 
functions and data throughout the entire application. So finally, what, once we get all this information, we pass it into the context provider and we'll go here to the main page. And you can see here, uh, we use a React hook called use context and hooks are another uh, big React topic. So if you're interested in reading up more about them, uh, you can check out the React docs as well. Uh, but to summarize what they are, uh, short, uh, keep it short and sweet, uh, they are basically a special type of function that can allow a React application to function a lot more optimally and uh, with less code use, but so you can reuse code throughout the entire application, um, whereas you couldn't before in class components. But uh, looking at the main page of the application, you can see we can just pass in user here, and when we load, um, when we when we load all this information when we log in, uh, we want to wait for this user to be validated to an actual user, and if not, uh, we just render this header tag saying please log in to use. So um, this. You know, again, this is really useful. The, the use really isn't that obvious in an application this tiny, but if you were using a large scale multi-page application, uh, this would be incredibly useful and um, necessary for the optimal user experience. So uh, with that being said, uh, we're gonna jump into how the contract is actually passed through the application. So um, first of all, let me go to Auth.js again. And what we're doing here, uh, as I mentioned before, we're using a JavaScript library called ethers.js. And it's a code base that allows you to interact with smart contracts deployed on uh, the main net, test nets, but it, it's a lot more uh, concise and simple, more simple to use than web3.js, which is a uh, popular method of accessing smart contracts through JavaScript. So um, we're, for the purpose of this application, we want to interact with a, a smart contract that's already deployed to the blockchain. So walking through the steps of how to do that, uh, it'll become clear how that's possible. Um, first off, we want to get a provider. And in this case, we're using RinkB. So we just hard code that in and Ethers is able to get the provider just through this line. And uh, from there, we want to create a new wallet instance. And the way to do that is we pass in that provider from the prior line and we get the private key that Taurus provides when a user logs in. And uh, this is how this uh, is what we set to the ethers state variable. And we'll go ahead and go to a uh, file here and see how we can actually pass a contract instance through the entire application. So. Uh, we call use user context again, uh, get the user, get the wallet instance, and we want to check, okay, if either of these is null, then we can't actually connect to the contract because we need a valid user and we also need, um, you know, the ethers wallet instance. So once that's taken care of, if all that checks out, we're able to get the address for the deployed smart contract by uh, directly accessing the ABI here hard coding in RinkB's uh, network ID, which is four. And then finally, we can return the contract instance by passing in the address from above, uh, the ABI itself that we import up here, and the ethers wallet provider that uh, we initiated in auth.js. So uh, now that that's all taken care of, back here, uh, with that custom hook we made, use contract in the other file, we can actually pass uh, the contract instance throughout the entire application like you would context. So uh, again, the use might not seem that obvious in a single page application like this, but in multi-page applications, you wanna be able to access that data wherever you are. So uh, it can be incredibly important. So once we actually have that contract instance, uh, we're able to load the information, uh, the input field, the button where you can actually set a new value uh, for the smart contract and view the original value from the smart contract. So uh, that is a run through of how we use custom hooks and the context hook to uh, distribute that information across the application.